10, 9, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Let's go. Excellent. So today, uh, coming on the mindfulness, so I mentioned I would do this um, today, was the mindfulness of Satipatthana of the jitta of the mind, mindfulness of the mind. And I did mention that sometimes the way that mindfulness is practiced in many places is not mindfulness, but brainfulness. But this is actually brainfulness, like just ideas, intellectual ideas of the mind. But this is actually real mindfulness of the thing in life called the mind. And the first thing to say about that is the way it was used by the Buddha. There was three main words which he used for the thing which we understand as the mind. And that was uh, mano, vinyana, and chitta. And each one of those was almost like an alternative because the Buddha said many times that which people called the jitta, that which they call, what they call it, the mind, or they call it consciousnesses, all of those things. They say this is what we understand vaguely as the mind. But many people, because they don't know the mind very clearly, they have all these weird theories about the nature of this thing, which we call the mind. So I'm now going to read out the Sutta, which is uh, the Satipatthana Sutta, the mindfulness of the jitta, the mind. How are you mindful of the mind? You understand a mind that is affected by wanting as such, and a mind that is unaffected by wanting as such. Now straight away, there is a change of the words here. It doesn't say that you are mindful of a mind that is affected by wanting. You say that you understand. It's a different word, pajanati. It's the verb which is connected to panya, which is wisdom. It's like a wisdom understanding. So you understand a mind that is affected by wanting something. What does that feel like when you want something? How does that affect not just your seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, but this knowing, this mind? Straight away, you should understand it distorts it stretches it. It stretches for wanting something in the future or by getting rid of something in the past. And you understand a mind is unaffected by wanting as such. And this is a very rare mind that is unaffected by wanting, which is at peace and content. One of the things I didn't say this morning, which I regret I didn't say, was that there's a wonderful saying that when you want something more, you cannot appreciate what you already have. You can't enjoy it. The wanting something more takes away the focus, the enjoyment, the valuing of what you already have. And that is something for me as a monk who say, crikey, why do I want anything more? This is not the best. But just wanting something spoils it. I can't enjoy it. So when you want something more, you cannot enjoy what you already have. In other words, wanting is one of the main causes of suffering, not being at peace. So understand this, a mind affected by wanting and a mind unaffected by wanting. But how can you do that? That's a very powerful thing for you to actually to penetrate. So how you do that, you may remember that this is actually what the Sutta says, or rather the abbreviation of the Sutta, because the point which I mixed out, which I've missed out, was for all parts of the Satipatthana, you only do this practice once you have restrained the five hindrances. Vinaye loke abhijadomanasa. When you're energized, 
mindful, knowing the purpose of what you're doing. Why are you doing this? So the most important part here, especially with this Satipatthana, is that the five hindrances are weak enough you can maybe understand what this mind truly is. And that said, even in the Anapanasati, it's not just always mindfulness of the breath. You do the breath as much as you possibly can until it's done its purpose. And then you go on to this thing called limitus. That's the first time you can have a reasonably good idea of what this mind is. Otherwise, it's a mind which is uh, almost so tainted by the five senses. I gave the simile of the gold. And this is a simile of the Buddha. You only know what gold is once you can purify it from all the other metals and contaminants in it. So it's just 100% pure gold. The only way you can know what a mind is, when it's just a mind there and nothing else contaminating it. It's a Buddha simile. So you understand a mind affected by wanting and a, and, and, and a mind which is not affected by wanting. You understand a mind affected by aversion as such and a mind that is unaffected by aversion as such. You understand a mind that is affected by delusion as such and a mind that is unaffected by delusion as such. You understand a contracted mind as a contracted mind and that's explained as because of dullness and drowsiness. So that hindrance of being dull and drowsy means you've got a very small mind. It's just bound in a prison of dullness and drowsiness. And a distracted mind is this distract because of restlessness and remorse. So you see here the five hindrances are included here. Dullness, sorry, wanting, first hindrance, aversion, second hindrance, delusion, that is also part of doubt. You're not really quite sure what you're doing and why you're doing it. And I didn't mention, but I should have mentioned in when I started talking about things like animators, <coughs> that in all the years I've been teaching and people say that they have a light in the mind, they think it couldn't be an animator, they doubt. It's veracity, they're just imagining this or someone shining a light in their eyes or there's some other experience of the nimitta not seen uh, by the visual language, but you're feeling it or hearing it or smelling it or something. We mentioned that a day or two ago, that people doubt that so much. And I said, wonder, why are you doubting it? Because roughly about 98% of the time, if you think you're seeing a nimitta, you are. And this is that being honest with you. That all these people who meditate, and sometimes I couldn't have been an imitator, it couldn't. And they talk with them and say, look, it probably was. But what's fascinating for me, why do people doubt it? And a lot of times it is because they don't have enough respect for themselves in their own meditation. And if you don't have any doubt about it, but you realize this is probably true, this probably is an imitator, then instead of disturbing it with the hindrance of doubt, you allow it to be. And the weird thing is that even if it wasn't a limiter to begin with, if you have confidence in it and stay with it, it turns into a real limiter, a powerful one, which you cannot deny was a real thing. So that's one of the reasons why if you see any of these things happening, don't doubt yourself, just go for it and allow it to be. So anyway, this is mindful of the jitter stuff, mindful of aversion, of the mind affected by aversion, <coughs> aversion or wanting, delusion, affected by uh, sloth and torpor, and one which is uh, distracted by restlessness. And that's the first part of the mindfulness of the jitter. And then the second part is you understand an exalted mind, a surpassed mind, a still mind, a liberated mind. And all of those are different synonyms for a mind which is within jhana. And you also understand an unexalted mind, an unsurpassed mind, not still, not liberated mind, which is not in jhana. That is the meaning of those words. Different words, 
but explained in the suttas and also in the commentaries as referring to the same thing as in jhanas. Now I often mention this, but how on earth can you do the Satipatthana really when you haven't had experience of jhanas? Basically, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're looking at. It's one of the reasons why, even doing the Satipatthana, you can maybe start with the first two, but then it should lead into the experiencing of the jitta after doing the first two of the Satipatthanas. It should lead into jhanas, as the Anapanasati Sutta suggests, just doing meditation on the breath after the first four stages of just knowing or landmarks, just knowing the breath going in, going out, and just calm, calming it down, <coughs> knowing the whole breath. And Piti Sukha comes with the breath, the joy. That's the next four stages. That's described later on as Vedana and Sati, the Satipatthana of the experience. And then after that, the ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th stages of Anapanasati, that's when you are mindful of the mind, of the citta, and you, uh, you uh, brighten that, uh, Sampasadhanam Chittam, and then Samadhanam Chittam. Samadhanam means stilling it, brightening it, giving it energy, stilling it, and then lastly, Vimochiyam Chittam, the 12th stage of Anapanasati, for want of a better word. And that is liberating the mind in jhanas. It always means that. So even the Anapanasati, you know, this is that uh, third stage of Anapanasati, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th. That is uh, one way of practicing the third Satipatthana of the mind. So actually to really watch the mind and to do it fully, you do need the deep stillnesses. And this way, it says you are aware of your own chitta what a chitta actually is. Or you're aware that other chittas are of the same nature as yours. And that is a wonderful thing to notice. The jitta uh, does not have gender. Aya Chandra's jitta, my jitta is of the same make. It doesn't have uh, gender, it doesn't have nationality, doesn't have race, whether a person comes from Nigeria or Australia or from Poland, their chitters are of the same nature. It is not body, it's beyond the body. And that also <laughs> means that you know, when you get uh, to understand the nature of the chitta, especially, uh, this always gives me goosebumps to say this, but it's true. If you get into a jhana and you're experiencing your jitta and the five senses and the body has just gone for a while, the first jhana experience that you experience is exactly the same as the first jhana which the Buddha experienced. You want to know what it's like to be have the mind of a Buddha. I did mention this in the in the uh, the guided meditation before, but this takes it to the no another level. She experienced a second jhana. That's how the Buddha felt under the Bodhi tree. There's no difference there. You do have a taste of freedom. Of course, the taste disappears for most people. When you come out, you're back to your normal old self. But inside that deep meditation, it is the happiness, even the first jhana, I'll read this out later on, I hope. It's called Sambodhi Sukha. When I first read that again, I thought, is this correct? It's a misprint or something, because Sambodhi means enlightenment. What you're experiencing in this, even the first jhana, is a bliss of enlightenment. You're not enlightened. This is the mistake by the Buddha, or is he just trying to encourage people? And he's saying, this is what it feels like. You have direct experience for yourself, what it feels like. And that is powerful. So you understand what a mind is, Pajanati, you know it. 
And then, whew, you're aware of your own jitter, aware of others' jitters, including the Buddha's, are of the same nature as yours. I said, not, well, in the jhana, it's the same nature, but actually just afterwards, yours uh, diverges from the Buddha's jitter and you say all sorts of stupid things or bad jokes. <laughs> That's me. But anyway, uh, or you're aware of the nature of both your own and others' jitters. Or, and this is also important, or else you abide aware of what causes the arising of the jitter, where it comes from, it's caused. It's not, in, it's not permanent, it's not always there. This mind of yours, this knower, is not a permanent entity. It's caused by Nama Rupa, literally the objects of the mind cause the mind to arise. You abide aware the jitter is of the nature to cease when Nama Rupa cease. Or you abide contemplating the jitter's nature of both arising and ceases, ceasing. Or else mindfulness that it is just a jitter, impermanent, suffering, and not me, not my, not a permanent essence. It's established in you to the extent necessary for mindfulness and wisdom essential to liberation. Didn't you realize your mind, the jitter, is impermanent. It's not deathless. It's not eternal. It's cause. And when the cause goes away, so does the jitter. And that way you abide independent, not clinging to anything in this world. Now, the story which the Buddha gave, this was to Aga Wachigota. Uh, it's Agi Wachigota Sutta. Wachigota was a wanderer. And he, he asked, what happens? Just you know when you know, the, a Buddha and a lighter one uh, dies, where do they go? And the Buddha answered, like many times, with a simile to make it easy to understand. And the simile which the Buddha used in the Wachagota Sutta was of a fire. And he used a simile of like a wood fire. But I've changed that simile slightly and used a simile of like a lamp, an oil lamp. Or even better for many people in Europe, a candle. And a flame of a candle depends, is caused by three things. The wick, the wax in the candle, and also heat. You need three things there. When they all come together, there's a wax there, there's a the wick there, and you light the candle, in other words, you add the heat to it, you get a flame. And sooner or later, one of those causes disappears. Either the wax is all used up, the wick is all burnt out, or somebody blows the heat away. And any one of those causes, not all three, but even one of them is enough for the flame to nibbuta, to nibbana, to cease. And then the Buddha asked Wachagota, said, well, where does the flame go once its causes have been extinguished? He said, it doesn't go anywhere. He said, the question does not apply. It's a silly question. It doesn't go anywhere. It's not destroyed because the flame was just the result of three causes. It wasn't something permanent, which is now demolished. It's just like a flame. And this is one of the similes the Buddha said, after a person becomes enlightened, you don't go anywhere. There's nothing there to begin with. It's just a process which has now come to an end. And that's what it said. It's just a jitter. It's like a flame. Elton John was very correct when describing Princess Diana. A flame in the wind, now blown out. Uh, however, Princess Diana, I don't think was enlightened, but nevertheless, a Buddha was even a more powerful flame. 
doesn't go anywhere. So the jitta, impermanent suffering, not me, not mine, and not a permanent essence, is established in you to the extent necessary for mindfulness and wisdom, essential to liberation. And your body depend not clinging to anything in the world. That is how you're mindful of the mind. And again, I can't, uh, I can't avoid mentioning a simile which I uh, invented. I think I invented it, but sometimes these similes which I think I invent, I realized later on I heard it from an Ajahn Chah or another great monk, or even the Buddha said it. But this was a simile of the tadpole and the frog, which I think many of you have heard before, but it's a powerful simile. A tadpole could not know the nature of water, even though it lives in water. Water is always there, born in water. It can study water, but it can still not know its nature. No more than the fish could know the nature of water. Can you know the nature of your mind? It's always there. Ever since you started thinking or knowing, the mind is always there. How can you know its nature? So eventually, this tadpole goes into a frog. And the frog jumps out of the water. Something which has always been there, which in part is Nietzsche, always there, dependable, sometimes has vanished. That's what happens in the deep meditation. Because of stillness, things disappear. They vanish. That's why I prefer that, one, that wonderful book, The Art of Disappearing. You disappear, things vanish. That shocks you. It's, it's crazy stuff. Because it's like for the first time in her life, the little tadpole, something is missing, which has always been there. It's vanished, it's disappeared. Water. Only now can the tadpole, now a frog, have the data necessary to understand what water was. So your five senses and the five sense consciousnesses, once those five sense consciousnesses disappear, you change from being a tadpole to a frog. You can meditate to the point of things being disappeared and enter these deep meditations. That means that now you can see what's disappeared. As you go deeper in the meditations, even your mind starts to disappear. The consciousness starts to vanish. The mind consciousness. And now you know what that mind truly is or truly was. So these are powerful teachings to know the mind in China and know the mind outside of China be able to do that. It's not what the mind of China is like, it's rather what's missing when you're experiencing those jhanas. What is anichard? What has disappeared? What's vanished? And after a while you learn your Pali, the Buddha never meant just things coming and going like the waves on the surface of the lake. Up and down, up and down, that's so superficial. What anicca truly means is you're watching the lake, you maybe see ripples on the surface, like waves on the surface of the lake, up and down, up and down, impermanent. That's only superficial impermanence. It's when the whole lake vanishes, disappears. That's weird. It's not supposed to happen, you think. And it's actually scary, honestly scary. But if you manage to, to stay there, enjoy the bliss of being free from so many burdens, then you find out that this is beautiful. And when you come out afterwards, what was missing? You realize these things aren't permanent. They disappear, they vanish. And they're joyful because when they do vanish, it's like suffering has disappeared. A particular type of suffering. It's easy for monks and nuns to say, oh, the body is suffering, but who actually believes that? You believe it might be sick and you can ease that suffering by getting healed or taking some medicine or something. But we still really believe that this body is a source of happiness and pleasure for us. 
when you get into these deep meditations, you're mindful of the jitter. Oh my goodness. You know for sure that the body is suffering. Even it's made beautiful forms, the most beautiful thing you could ever see. The most wonderful sound you can ever hear. Smells, tastes, physical touches. Suffering. The whole, please excuse me, the whole bloody dot. Now, the next part of the Sakatana. Mindfulness of mind objects. Of like dhammas. Mind objects of dhammas, I still haven't really settled on which one to use. The, the part is said the mindfulness of dhammas, Satipatthana, the fourth Satipatthana being aware of dhamma. And Okay, yeah. Wonderful thing about this was that uh, uh, nice friendly monks who I associate with, people like Ajahn Sujato and Ajahn Bhumali and Analio and a few other sort of little um, rebellious monks and nuns who question normal translations and, and actually look at the suttas they found these many different types of versions of the Satipatthana Sutta. And the, some of them, they seem to be really early parts of Satipatthana. And the, for the fourth Satipatthana, the focus of mindfulness on Dhammas, they only have the five hindrances and the seven enlightenment factors, that's all. All the other things are absent. And because it's the simplest form of the Satipatthana Sutta, there are many people like Ajahn Sujato infer that it's the earliest form. There's a very good argument for that. Simple. So with that Satipatthana, all you're really getting to know and understand through mindfulness training is five hindrances and the seven enlightenment factors. Five hindrances are like the enemies. Seven enlightened factors are the solutions. Let's see how the Buddha put it. How are you mindful of mind objects, of dhammas? Again, having restrained the five hindrances, uh, mindful and understanding what you're doing and why you're doing it. You're mindful of mind objects in terms of the five hindrances. When there was wanting regarding the five senses, I use this carefully, when there was wanting regarding the five senses, you are mindful of there was such wanting. When there is no wanting regarding the five senses, you are mindful that there is no such wanting. This is karma chanda. Word karma here refers to the five senses. You also understand how such wanting arises and how to let go of such wanting and how such wanting doesn't arise again. Now, I often use the word wanting rather than craving or desire, because desire is a much stronger form of wanting, and craving is almost an extreme uh, form of wanting. And the word danha doesn't mean either of those extreme forms. When people understand craving as the translation, it means, well, yeah, we're not craving it, we just need it. So it's almost it's an excuse to allow many types of wanting into especially your meditation and you find it is counterproductive. And the same thing as this is wanting, when there's aversion, when there's dullness and drowsiness, restlessness and remorse, when there was doubt in you, you are mindful there was such doubt. When doubt's actually there, you can't see it clearly. That's why those hindrances, they distort understanding of what's there. You can't be mindful when you are wanting. One of the reasons why that, that definition of mindfulness, which I gave during some time, one of these days uh, so far, that wanting of being in the present moment and also being still, being silent, sorry. So simple things like present moment awareness and also um, silence in the mind. Otherwise, not being in the present moment means that you are you are not aware of what's happening right now. You're going off into the future sometimes, and that's just fantasy. And the past is distorted. 
which is one of the reasons that you, you know, you, you've got so rid of your five hindrances. But when you have wanting in you, you know, you find out you're not in the present moment. You're, you're, you're fantasizing about the past. Aversion is fantasizing about, sorry, wanting is fantasizing about the future, where you want to be in another time, another place, and what it's going to be like there. The aversion is about what happened in the past. You don't want to revisit that. Dullness and drowsiness, how can you be mindful when you're dull? You've got a little bit of mindfulness in there, but not really strong enough to understand it. Restlessness and remorse and doubt, the mind is just not clear enough, it's moving. That's one of the reasons why that I translated very carefully, when there was wanting regarding the five senses, you're mindful that there was such wanting. When there's no wanting, you're clear, so you can know what the five senses are. You know what's happening. So those are the five hindrances. And the Buddha's similes of these, again, it's just a beautiful simile, this is why I put them in here. It's not from the Satipatthana Sutta, but it's uh, from another sutta, Majjhima 39. Wanting. Suppose you took out a loan and your business was successful. Then you repaid that loan and there was enough left over for your own enjoyment and for that of your family. As a result, you'll be glad and full of joy. So when these five hindrances were present, you look back on them as a debt, wanting, something you have to pay off, you're not free. But when those five hindrances are gone, sorry, when the first hindrance is gone, then it's like you paid off your loan. You're free of debt, nothing to worry about anymore. Wanting is like taking out a loan of happiness. And you find that you have to pay it back again afterwards. When there's aversion, suppose you were very ill and you couldn't eat or sleep and had no strength. Later, however, you recovered, could eat and sleep again, you regained your strength. As a result, you'd be glad and full of joy. So when those five hindrances were present, you look back upon the second hindrance, aversion, as a disease. And that's like you're cured. It's not the other people we're talking about here, you're averse to, or the things you're averse to. The negativity, the aversion, is an illness, a disease. That's one of the reasons why when people are very averse, they sometimes they, they um, get depressed, even suicidal. That's like a disease, a disease of the mind. And even if you're averse to you know, hearing some truths or to meditating or whatever, you can actually see just how that is like this is it weakens you. Uh, dullness and drowsiness. Suppose you were imprisoned and later were released, safe and secure, with no loss to your property. As a result, you'd be glad and full of joy. So the dullness and drowsiness is like being in a prison. You can't go where you want to. You can't really be aware because you know the, you're dull, you've got no energy. Or the fourth hindrance, restlessness and remorse. Thinking too much can't be still, always just on the move. Suppose you were a slave dependent on others, unable to go where you want. Then later you were released from slavery, independent of others, able to go where you want. As a result, you'll be glad and full of joy. So restlessness and remorse, that hindrance is like being a slave, especially being a slave to desires for wanting, never allows you to be free. What do you really want? Why do you want it? It keeps you on the move all the time, wanting something more, something extra. So freedom from slavery is learning how to be still. And lastly, doubt. Uh, suppose you had to travel along a, a dangerous road across a wilderness, but later you would pass through that wilderness, safe and secure, with no loss to your property. As a result, you'd be glad and full of joy. So the doubt, 
is like going through a wilderness where there's no signs of which way you should go and how you can get out of that wilderness. That's a simile for doubt. And I was being really serious there, but unfortunately, my nature is I can't always be that serious. So one of the similes for doubt, which I've said on retreat, was of this person who was uh, in the desert, totally lost, dehydrated, uh, crawling on his hands and knees, just no feeling he's not going to make it through this wilderness, he's going to die there. And in the distance, he could see the horizon shimmering. And he thought this must be, must be just, uh, he's losing his mind or a mirage or something. But as he watched, that object which was shimmering on the horizon was approaching him, coming closer and closer. And he thought this is actually something moving towards him. Maybe it's a chance of getting saved and they won't be lost in the desert anymore. And as it came closer and closer, he couldn't believe his eyes. It was actually a man in furs on a sled being pulled by these husky dogs. And he thought, it really is, the heat has got to him. It's, what is this doing in the desert? But as it came even closer, he could hear the dogs pulling the sled, barking, woof, 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 woof. And the man, he was smiling at this person who was crawling on his hands and knees. And as he came even closer, the dog started licking him. He realized this wasn't a mirage. It wasn't a fantasy. It was regal. He'd escaped from the desert. And this, this man got the energy to stand up and said, and said to this man in his sled who was an Inuit, he said, I've been lost in the desert for days, said this man who had who would be crawling on his hands and knees. And the Inuit replied, and you think you're lost? Okay, I thought that was funny when I heard it. I hope you didn't mind. <laughs> okay, anyway, so being, so too, when these five hindrances were present, you look upon them as a debt, disease, a prison, slavery, and a dangerous road across the wilderness. Why do you want to linger in those places? But when his five hindrances have been abandoned, regard them as freedom from debt. You don't want anything. You don't have to work hard to pay off your debts. You look upon them as uh, freedom, uh, you look upon them as health. You know what it's like when you're sick? You're always trying to find some way out of that. This is the emotional health. When you're free of aversion. You don't get upset or angry at anything. Why? Released from a prison, from sloth and torpor. You can go places, you can walk wherever you want. You're not this tiredness and dullness around you all the time. And freedom from slavery, no restlessness and remorse. You're not being driven to do things. You found out what's driving you and you settle it, which means you can be peaceful. No restlessness, no remorse. And lastly, freedom from doubt. You reach the land of safety. The seven enlightenment factors, the opposite of the five hindrances. Oh. Or you are mindful of mind objects or dhammas in terms of the seven enlightenment factors, which I love. When the enlightenment factor of mindfulness is present in you, you understand that it is present. But when the enlightenment factor of mindfulness was not present in you, you understand that it was absent. It was absent. You also understand how there comes to be the arising of the absent enlightenment factor of mindfulness and how it comes to, be how it comes to fulfillment by development. What is mindfulness? How is it developed? You come into this present moment and you're silent. And you value that. What you really value in your life, especially your spiritual life, that is where it starts to grow. It's important. It's much more important than anything else. So you give it more time. And it grows. You let it grow. You don't make it grow. When the enlightened factor exploring the Dhamma is present in you, 
and exploring it, not thinking about it. Goodness gracious, we get great thinkers and they just make headaches for themselves and other people. We're exploring it, as I mentioned, to explore it in silence. That is the best. I did mention, of, uh, uh, what is the name again? Davison. He was the person over in Cambridge who uh, understood quantum tunneling. And the first person to do that. And he also, uh, that was the foundation for um, supercomputers in that time operating at close to zero degrees Kelvin. And anyway, I won't say the details of it, but anyway, he got a Nobel Prize for that. First Welshman to get a Nobel Prize in physics. And anyway, he got that insight after meditating. Amazing. So he explored the Dhamma. And for him, it was the, what he was working on, quantum tunneling, and it got him a Nobel Prize. Ooh. Exploring the Dhamma, not thinking about it, but just seeing it and seeing it come right up to you. When the alignment factor of energy is present in you, and these things lead to one another. When you're mindfulness, real mindfulness, then you can actually explore the Dhamma very easily. You're not thinking about it, you're knowing it. And when you explore the Dhamma, energy does come up inside of you. You get sort of bright, and fluffy tailed, as they say up, up here. And when energy comes up in you, you have a factor of joy. This is like pity. It's wonderful joy in you that you're, you're having fun with what you're doing. And those of you who've known me for a long time, that I enjoy what I'm doing. I really have fun meditating, even teaching, because joy comes up. What happens after joy? The next enlightenment factor is tranquility, passati. When you have joy in your mind, it's easy to sit still. There's no joy in the mind, you know, you're restless and the body starts to move all over the place. That's a chitta passati, and also, so that's a kaya passati, and also the chitta passati comes afterwards, the tranquility of your mind. And after tranquility is present in you, the sixth factor, the stillness is present in you. This is an enlightenment factor, the stillness, samadhi. Sama samadhi, as you all know, is the jhana. This is what happens, these are the enlightenment factors. And when the enlightenment factor of, uh, after stillness, it's like equanimity I have here in the paper, but these days I think I prefer contentment. Imagine the meaning of contentment and equanimity. One is very dull. The other one is very beautiful. The English word contentment. Nothing you want anymore, need anymore. So when the alignment factor of contentment is present in you, you understand that it's present. When the alignment factor of contentment was not present in you, you understand that it was absent, and you also understand how there comes to be the arising of the absent enlightenment factor of contentment, and how it comes to fulfillment by development. And these become the core mind objects of dhammas. You are aware of dhammas, or you're aware of the other people's mind objects of the same as nature of yours, mindfulness and stillness, all these other factors, doesn't matter who experiences them, this is beyond a person, this is just the truth. Or you else, you're by the way, what causes the arising of these dhammas? Attention, giving importance to them. That's how attention works. You know that when I teach, to get the attention of the onlookers, you've got to make it important and joyful. That's why I tell jokes. So people can understand exactly what's saying. It's easy to pay attention to it. And are you abide aware that mind objects are of the nature to cease when attention ceases? Are you abide contemplating mind objects causal nature? Or else mind is just mind objects, it's dumbness. They're impermanent, suffering, not me, not mine, not a permanent essence. They're a path of liberation. If you stick on that path, you don't get liberated. I think you understand what I mean then. In other words, you attach to the path. Mm -hmm.
And you abide independent, not clinging to anything in the world. That is how you are mindful of mind objects. We've done this for Sadhguru So that is enough about the Sutta class. Now is the time not to be attached to teaching, but to attached to letting go. If you need a toilet break, now is a wonderful time to visit your favorite toilet. You make it favorite. <laughs> there might not be much choice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so for questions, thank you, Ajahn. I have to say, I love this kind of deep dhamma. It's really uplifting and inspiring. Yes. Uh, just a little story while people are in the toilet. That, I, yeah, I like teaching it as well. But sometimes people say, it's too deep for me. I'm only a lay person. I don't want to become a monk. I don't want to become enlightened because I've got things to do in the world. And I remember just the first time I taught in Singapore. And uh, people had actually heard me many times on YouTube or somewhere to come over here to Perth. I remember the, the president of the Buddhist Fellowship at that time was a lawyer. And I told more talks about opening the door of your heart, two bad bricks in the wall, truckload of dung in the front of your door, all those sorts of stories, which are important, they're great. But he said, I want deep dharma. Can you just give one talk which on deep dharma? Did you really want a deep dharma talk? I asked him, he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't know what he was asking for. So in the evening, I really gave it to him in a talk with many people. And I really laid it on the line about sort of, you know, deep down with the nature of things. And then afterwards, the next morning, when he picked me up to take me to breakfast, and I said, please, Ajahn, I'll never do that again. Why not? That's what you asked for. He said, but I never slept all night. It was scary for him, telling the truth. Just like when you've been in jail for so many lifetimes, to open the door and show people what it's like outside. They're fascinated, they're interested, but are they really ready for it? Lovely little story there. It's happened many times before. Sometimes people are really afraid of the truth. Eventually, once you put it in people's minds, you can't avoid it. It's the truth, it's real. See it in the suttas. See it in your favorite monks and nuns. It's true. So, shall we start, Ajahn? Because. Okay, uh, yes, yeah, certainly. I'm quite yeah, sure on. that we'll get a lot of questions. Yeah. Uh, okay, so someone's saying, during meditation, I'm experiencing thoughts of subtle aversion that keep echoing in my mind. I tried substituting with joy, but the echo keeps coming back. What skillful means can I use to overcome this hindrance? Welcome the echo. Because if it's aversion, you're trying to get rid of it, you're being averse to the aversion. So welcome, well, thank you, aversion, for coming to visit me. It's the anger eating demon story again. So you look at the aversion with welcoming. Thank you. I don't know what you're trying to treat me, but you can come in any time you like. Then aversion has no power over you from that moment on. You're welcoming what's happening right now. In other words, you're giving it love and kindness, opening the door of your heart to this weird experience. Experience is not aversion, it's how you react to it is. Next question, please. These are, um, I thought these sort of questions might come. So, if the conscious mind is impermanent, what is deathless? The deathless is a bad translation. It's like absence of death. It's it disappears. That's the word deathless, ah, matter. Matter is the, the death. Amata does not mean the opposite of death. It means the absence of it. It's a privative um, suffix in grammar. I don't want to be so pedantic and 
you know, just about the nature of language. But sometimes we add to the language something which is not really there. And that's where we get into trouble. A good example of that is, um, what's it called? Um, the Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, or Alice Through the Looking Glass. I can't remember which one it was. But when the Alice arrived at the square of the Red Queen, and the Red Queen said, did you see anybody on the road? Because I'm expecting my messenger to arrive. And Alice said, I saw no one on the road. Really, you saw no one. What good eyes you have. It's as much as I can do to see someone. And you can see no one. Wow, you've such got gifted sight. <laughs> and then soon the messenger arrived. And the messenger, I said, did, uh, the Queen asked the messenger, did you see anybody on the road? And said, the messenger said, I saw no one on the road. Oh, yes, this, this young lady, Alice, she saw the same person on the road. She saw no one on the road. But why were you so late? Well, I ran as fast as I could, said the messenger. But, and no one passed me on the road. Exactly. No one passed you on the road, so no one runs faster than you. Yeah, that's true, Your Majesty. No one runs faster than you. So you're very slow. And had all these, these, these ideas of making a person out of no one, like an existing entity, out of what is a word which describes nothing. I call these absence words. And it's, it's common that people make something out of a word which is meant to describe the absence of something, not something else. So deathless is an absence word in Pali, the ahmata. The end of dying. The end of dying, there's no dying in that state. No, it's uh, nothing left. End of dying is a good word, good translation. <clears throat> Similar questions are coming. So if the chitta doesn't go anywhere, then is that annihilationism? I actually mentioned that you weren't paying attention. <laughs> it's not annihilation because there's nothing there to begin with. It's just a process. Are you annihilating the flame of a candle when it goes out? You don't annihilate it. All that flame was to begin with was the heat, the wax, and the wick coming together. Now the wick, wick, the wax, and the heat are just ended. So the flame ends. You don't exterminate it. You're not annihilating it. There was no essence to it to begin with. It was empty without a core. Um, so then what is it that gets reborn? What it gets reborn is a stream of consciousness. And the idea of a stream of consciousness, Vinyana Sota said the Buddha, is just like a, a great simile. A river, which you see like the River Thames in London. I haven't been to London two or three years, but if I go on to say Hammersmith Bridge, I used to run across that when, when I was in school as part of the so-called cross-country run. But it wasn't in the country, it's just next to the river on the towpaths. But anyway, when you're standing on say Hammersmith Bridge, the water you see there looks the same every day. But it's not the same water. It's a stream, it flows. It is a thing which we recognize as the mind. It's just like a stream, it flows. It's not the same from one moment to the next. It's a flowing of causes and effects. And this is actually why it's a process, not a thing. Just like, remember just in the old days, being in London, going to the movies as a kid, and I did this because, remember in those days, I was as old as me, you went to the movies and everyone was smoking in there. And so that had one benefit to it, not many benefits, but you could actually look back and you can see this cone of light from the screen where the movie was being projected onto. You trace it back and it came to this, this narrow part of the cone to its core, which was the projector. And so as a kid, I looked back and said, oh, that's where the movie is coming from. This little box of light. And there was this celluloid film, just many hundreds of photos, all sort of linked together, 
stills, but <coughs> sorry, still photographs, but run very fast, giving the illusion of continuous movement. And that illusion of continuity, because the mind could take an object up very fast. And we always think it's continuous, it's not. It's fragmentary, just like a movie film. It's got pixels, if you like. And each pixel is uh, uh, stimulated and then sort of uh, turns off you know, in the screen of your computer, which you're watching me on. You're not watching Ajahn Brahm. It's an image which is moving very fast, but it's so, if you look very carefully at the pixels, they're just turning on and off, on and off, but they turn off, they rise and fall. And there's spaces in between where they don't arise at all. They pause for a while. That's the nature of consciousnesses. There's six different types of consciousness. According to the Buddha, sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, and the mind consciousness. I think you're referring to the mind consciousness. But after a while, when you know that really well, it's a process, not a thing. Right. We're getting um, a lot of really good questions. Um, yeah. I'll just ask this as a follow up, maybe just quickly. Uh, yeah. So, what is our Buddha nature then? What is, is there our such Buddha a thing? nature? It's just a word. And <laughs> the Buddha nature is the ability that each one of us can see this for ourselves and we can all end. We can all cease. In other words, we can all stop. Just like a flame. In the words, this was something which, in the language of our times, in the uh, Ratana Sutta, they use the word Nibuto Dira Yatayang Pradipa, that you are subject to Nibbana just like a flame of a lantern. And this is in the Ratana Sutta. It's, a, it's one of my favorite sutras, which we chant so often. When I get to that point, it's almost like I feel like putting my hands up and just side of side of side of. Every kid, you know, in India in the time of the Buddha would understand what the word nibbana meant. It means it ceased. So mummy would say, Hey Johnny, the, the candle's nibbana. Can you light it again or something? And this is actually a word which in common usage which was then used by the Buddha to apply to the ceasing of things, not annihilation of things, but ceasing of things. Okay. <clears throat> We've got a couple of questions about enlightenment that are quite similar. One person's asking, why is it that some people get enlightened in this life and others don't? And can everyone get enlightened? Yeah, basically everyone can get enlightened. Whether they will or not, we don't know. Everyone can... Uh, Everyone can go and see this uh, this class. Everyone can join under Kampa Bikuni project and support Ayachanda, but how many will? <laughs> so everyone can, but not everyone will. And number two is what was it? What why be enlightened or was it? No, why why are some people enlightened in this life and others are not? So the different speeds. Well, Different speeds, yes, because why are some people just graduate and some people don't? It's not just different speeds, but what do you really want? And have you had enough of wanting? How's your history? How's your mindfulness? Who are you? What is, what is your mind state right now? What have you listened to? What dhammas have you been fortunate enough to hear? Look, it's just like uh, let's not talk about enlightenment here, but just jhanas. Why do some people get jhanas, some people don't? A lot of time is because people tell you it's not necessary. Or they tell you oh, you're a lay person, lay people can't get, you're a woman, you can't get enlightened as a woman. Some people say that. Total BS. You know what BS means? It means bullshit, but I'm not allowed to say that. Oops, I have. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> You know that sometimes what some people say is just totally you know, off the planet. Everybody can achieve a jhana. Okay. Why do and some that... people do and some people don't? And it's sometimes because they don't have confidence in themselves, they don't give it time. But they can, but a lot of people won't. 
even sick people, no energy can. That's an amazing thing. Even people with, who have, how uh, was it, disabled can. So one of the greatest things is just to do with the mind. It's nothing to do with the body. So if you can let go of the body long enough, then the limiters will come up and the jhanas will happen. Um, so a follow-up to that is, in our next lives, do we keep the good practices and remember the Dhamma we heard in previous lives? That's in case we don't get enlightened. You don't remember them perfectly, but you remember enough of them. You have inclinations towards these things. Now, I can't say too much about my own practice and lives, but I just do remember the first time I saw a Buddhist monk. It blew me away. This was, you know, I didn't have any experience of Buddhist monks. I had a bit of, you know, sort of picture in a book or something, but actually to see one, a real one. Wow. That was mind-blowing. So where did that come from? Of course, you do remember a huge amount. You can actually just go backwards for a little while. But if you, if you understand the nature of Nibbana, in other words, you're a stream winner, then of course that will never go away. So if you were a stream winner in the last life, in this life you'll get the same experience again. See the same Dharma. It's like you experience stream winning a second time. You were stream winning before, but you have to experience it again. Okay. Uh Thank you very much for the teachings. Can you explain more about Nama Rupa? Nama Rupa, the simplest way of explaining it is that a simile of the Buddha, that consciousness, so Vinyana and Nama Rupa are like two sheaves of reeds or like the stalks you know, after the harvest, which the farmers lean against one another to support one another so that the sheaves of reeds can dry. And this is one of the reasons why the Buddha said specifically, you cannot have consciousness without objects of consciousness. What your mind knows, what it experiences, is what its objects are. Like the consciousness, the mind consciousness is like a screen. And you have things on the screen. That's the objects of it. But for the nature of the mind, once the objects disappear, so does the screen. The knowing and the known are so intri intricately connected together. Consciousness and the knowing, what it knows. Consciousness is not just always there, just waiting, dormant as it were, until it has an object which turns it on. It's when there's no object, the consciousness ceases. It's not a thing which is permanent, always there. It comes into being only when there's something to cause it to come into being, an object to be known. There's two sheaves of reed, when one is taken away, the other one falls down. The consciousness stops, the objects of consciousness stop. And the objects of consciousness stop, and consciousness ceases. If any of you, uh, there must be a few physicists there, the old uh, Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. Absolutely brilliant. Schro this quantum theory, okay. Uh, Schrodinger had this idea of putting this cat into a box. And in that box, there was a pill of cyanide. And the cyanide capsule would break due to a, a quantum process, decay of a cesium atom, I think he said. And it was a 50 50 chance that over, after five minutes, that cat would be alive or dead. And it was only a thought experiment. He never did any killing of cats. He wouldn't do that to his own cat. But it was a legitimate sort of proposition. And he was saying, that if you put the cat in the box and after five minutes, as he said, 
there's a 50-50 chance whether that cesium atom had decayed and broken the file of, um, of was it a poison to kill the cat. And he said, after five minutes, was that cat alive or was that cat dead? He said, neither. It wasn't alive, it wasn't dead. That cat didn't exist until you open a box when consciousness, the seeing of it happened, then you'll have the answer, then you'll have the cat. Cat didn't exist. There was a probability function, a quantum probability function until it was observed. The knowing creates the known. Is a brilliant sort of little piece of quantum physics, which came the closest I've ever seen to emulating the Buddhist idea of consciousness and what you're conscious of being interconnected. It's not consciousness always there waiting for things to happen. You are not independent. When things to be known cease, you go to. Okay, next question. Yep. Okay. Um, dear Ajahn, during meditation, when I get reasonably peaceful, I regularly get quite tangible feelings of movement in the mind. The body and five senses are there, but less noticeable. The mind feels spacious and feels like it's floating randomly. I have only twice before had very clear visual nimitters. Is this floating spacious mind more likely PT than nimitta? Yeah, it doesn't matter what it is. It's good stuff. So... What happens when you start getting very peaceful, the mind starts to, to get strong and dominate the five senses? The best way of describing this is like a kid has been freed from, uh, is finished school and uh, he's allowed to go overseas for the first time. And his mum and dad and uncles and aunties don't know what he's up to, he's free. Or like a person goes to university for the first time. They go a bit bananas the first couple of weeks because mum and dad doesn't know what they're up to. It's that freedom from being under control. That's like what your mind does. When you actually start letting go and go into meditation, your mind can really play around. If it does, please enjoy it. It's like a free gift. And I know that some teachers say, no, you see the weird things are floating up and down and see strange images and feel like you're, you're expanding or sinking into the floor. You're not sinking into the floor. It's not a psychic power. It's just your mind is playing around. It's free of all constraints or free of many constraints for a while because you're letting go much more. Let it have some fun because what that does, that encourages you to keep on meditating. It gives you a bit of a, a buzz for a little while. And then after a while, it settles down. Then you see the nice peaceful limiters. It's a great what you're doing. And those sorts of things happen. You're perfectly safe. Don't have to worry about a thing. It settles down by itself after a while. But enjoy uh, the free virtual reality show. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's good today we're having questions by people who haven't asked before. So uh, you just said that if, you, if we think we see a nimiter, it's very likely a nimiter. But I thought yeah. that when we see an emitter, we cannot think, is it an emitter? Because we're so oh. quiet, we cannot think. That's when you get into jhanas, that quiet, you can't think. Nimitters, it's liable if you think that you will disturb everything. But just a little thought, you're not totally peaceful yet, but pretty peaceful. And this is one of the problems there. That you know, if you see an emitter and you say too much, emitter goes away again. Nimitta is like to see animals in the forest. Did you hear that? Did your microphone pick that up? I just said that's a nimitta, but he said so softly. Sometimes those nimitters can't pick it up and they stay. But just keep it quiet. So, but basically, it's not you thinking it's a nimitta at the time. It's afterwards when they come to these interviews and they say, well, I saw a light, but no, I was looking at it afterwards, it couldn't have been. 
and saying that after you emerge from the meditation. We say, I saw that, but it couldn't have been a limiter. And we take them out and it, it was. Okay. Next? Yeah, next, yeah. Okay. Do you have practical suggestions to remember to respect our own practice? Enjoy it. Respect means you value it. It's important. And the more you value it, the more you respect it. It's uh, when people have, uh, say, cancers, uh, it's easy to get them to meditate a lot because this is life and death for them. And uh, what other reasons? You know, you get depressed, the emotional, the emotional problems people have. And I'm just really gobsmacked. I'm, I'm myself gobsmacked was what I was saying there. Really so surprised just how many times meditation heals these impossible problems in people. Emotional problems. Uh, even what was it that, that one was recently, this lady over in, I think, Poland, she had arthritis. She did meditation and it disappeared. That really shocked me. I've never heard uh, arthritis disappearing under sort of meditation. So many other stuff disappears. Anxiety. Uh, I mentioned this in that little book which I wrote about opening the door of your heart. The, on the second edition, since they needed a forward, a new forward. And so I wrote about this lady just a day or two before, flew all the way over from Europe to uh, Perth. And this was this delightful, dear, battered copy of uh, Open the Door of Your Heart in her hand. And she said this saved her life. She learned her meditation from this. And she just wanted me to sign it. And she flew all the way up from Bern, Switzerland, I remember now, all the way to Perth, just to get me to sign her book. She said, oh, thank you so much. And she was crying her eyes out. I need to go back in the taxi now to get back to Perth Airport to fly home. That's all she did. Come all the way from Europe, you know, to Perth, just to get her book signed. I don't get any money for what I do. We get job satisfaction it's through the roof. <laughs> so it happens, it works, right? Amazing. Okay, next question. Uh, I just wanted to ask, can you make the wish, for want of a better word, to be reborn in a situation favorable to practicing the Dhamma in the next life, i.e. to be reborn in a Buddhist family if I do not reach Nibbana in this lifetime? Yeah, you can make those wishes, but it really depends on what happens, you know, in your last years of your life, whether those wishes come true or not. Because sometimes you make those wishes when you're inspired. Now, later on in your life, you change your attitudes to things. You have other wishes which dominate. But look, it's not just wishing. They always say there's two causes to getting reborn here, reborn there. It's not just what you determine. But it's also your karma and your inclinations. There's a Buddha said, if a tree is leaning to the west, when it falls, it's liable to lean to the, liable to fall to the west. That's your inclinations. But it's also your, you know, the, your karma. Have you got enough karma to actually, to fall in that direction? So make lots and lots and lots of good karma. And those two, good karma and aspirations the likelihood is you to get to where you want to go. The same as if you have enough money and enough, enough plane ticket and no COVID, then you can come and see me in Perth. <laughs> so it's working. Good about it. Aspirations and the wherewithal to come. Okay. Can we translate the word Dhamma in mindfulness of mind objects as conditions? It feels to me more like that these are skillful and unskillful conditions than mind objects. Oh, well, I don't know. Conditions is something which is... Conditions, again, is one of those words which is a little bit bent now by people's usage. We have things like the unconditioned. 
as if that is a state of existence where you're free at last. I mean, it's, it's where the conditioning is not working anymore. It's free from the conditions. It's empty. And it's not sort of the idea of there is a state of mind where, where you're beyond all conditions. In other words, that you are conditioned. So if you are experiencing unconditioned, you are an oxymoron. You too are, are conditioned. So if you're unconditioned and what you're seeing is unconditioned, then you vanish. Disappear. Gone. Okay. At some moments or longer periods of the day, I'm aware of the presence of a certain weight or object in the chest area. Yesterday, the feeling of permanence of that something in the, in the area of chest or lungs extended to the stomach where I can feel it today as well. I don't attach much importance to it, but I wonder if anyone else feels something similar and is it common for it to appear? How would you advise me to treat it? Just to welcome it, be kind to it. Don't worry about it. It will come and go by itself. Like all things, they are un uncertain, impermanent. And nothing to worry about. If it's a heaviness, you know the, how that means to you. After a while, you'll find when you don't worry about it, it'll disappear. The nature of things. I don't know exactly how deep you are in meditation when these things start to happen, but a lot of times, if a body feels very heavy when you're very very still. But sometimes the next thing which will occur is the body totally vanishes. What is actually happening is that your mindfulness is increasing in its power. So what you're doing, you're, you're amplifying feelings which have always been there. They seem to, to be heavier or itchier. There's a common thing in meditation that's happened to me uh, early on that when you were meditating, you started to disappear, like your whole body was just tingling, like ants were crawling all over you. They're so pleasant. We didn't mind, but it was just so aware of your, your senses on your skin. And all that really was, was just your mindfulness was increasing. And so it was focusing on that and you're seeing much more of it. It was more intense, like the sound of the amplifier was being turned up so you could hear a louder sound. That's all that was. And so the feeling of like heaviness in the body, it's just that that's always been there, what you're actually experiencing, but now it's been amplified to be stronger and stronger and stronger. But it's just your mind is getting sort of dominant and the senses are, are calming down. And after a while, that heaviness, if it feels pleasant, will vanish. And then you won't feel your body and you go inside the mind. Okay. So, someone just wrote to say they um, feel similar all the time and it passes. Yeah. Hey, similar all the time. Yeah. It <laughs> yeah, yeah no, that's we, true. <laughs> we, yeah. we use language and when we're writing, I do the same. And sometimes you say one thing and they say another thing afterwards. <laughs> and which one is true? And the answer is they're both true, applying to different parts of the practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, conventional and ultimate or something. Okay, two, sure. just yeah. Yeah. On, yeah. Two more questions, Ajahn, unless more come. Um, so, yes, I can let and allow peace and contentment to grow, but I can't feel I'm really one pointed on anything in particular. Shouldn't I also be one pointed on something in order for jhana to happen? No. One pointedness happens by itself. Just what is actually one pointedness? It was actually actually Sajata said something. There's some valid validity to that. The Akagata. First of all, it's just not it's not just one point. Aga is a peak. It's not any old point. It's a summit. And if I use the Sanskrit form of Aga rather than the Pali form, the Sanskrit form of Aga is Agra. Agra, have you? Known the town of Agra in India, it was the capital, the peak of the Mughal Empire in India. That's where the Taj Mahal was, and the, the Red Fort. Agra, the peak. 
And this is actually why when you say ek agata, it's not just any aga, it's one peak of mind. And so that's, it happens quite naturally anyway. So you don't have to try and do it. Keep the peace and the silence because of the peace and the silence, when you're silent, it's a little trick to make sure that you don't interfere and say things and give instructions. But you incline emotionally towards these great peaks of meditation. You don't decide what to do. You don't give yourself instructions. You don't think the way through. You feel the way through. The emotional intelligence gets you deep, not the intellectual instructions. Intellectual instructions point in the right direction. Then you allow, allow your emotional wisdom to take over. So last question. If the mind and consciousness are dependently co-arising, then once the body falls away or dies, they should also fall away because they rely on each other. What happens when the body dies is that the mind just creates a mind-made body, manomayakaya. So it still has something to depend upon. But if the body totally disappeared, then instead of having a mind-made body, you have the mind just, well, it's another type of mind-made uh, existence, even in the jhanas. In the jhana realms, which appear after a person passes away, who have had experience of jhana and is not afraid of those great limiters. Have you ever noticed that once a person dies, what do they do? They go towards the light. Does that ring any bells? That light is a limiter. Your five senses are turning off. You're dying. And what you actually see is this beautiful light. And if you're not too afraid, that's where you get sucked into. If you're not too busy with other things you're attached to in this world, you know, unfinished business or whatever, then you, know, you don't stay as a, a ghost or as other type of being for a while, a spirit. You go straight into that light. You may even get into a, a jhana realm. Most people, they just go in there and come out and go into some sort of heaven realm for a while. But imagine just being sucked into there and just knowing what you're doing and how to turn those limiters into jhanas. Not what you actually say, what you decide to do, which is what you've been practicing for a long time. And that means that's your, the nature, it's just automatic, it's just how you incline. The tree doesn't decide to fall to the west when it's leading, leading to the west, that's what it's going to do. No decision. It's just well, the, the result of all those leanings and inclinations over the whole many years. And that's actually what happens when you pass away. So learning meditation, deep meditation that like we're teaching you here, is actually, I sometimes call these courses uh, Dying 101. Learning how to die, but dying with wisdom, with kindness, learning how to let go so much. When the limiter comes up, you can really make the best use of it. Okay, there's another part, a personal part to this question. Yeah. So they're asking, um, so what is passing to the next life? When my grandma passed, I felt her presence one evening and even saw her as a small ball of light that came to visit my room. But I've read that Theravada rejects the idea of um, a popular spirit or mind that passes between lives? No, they don't. <laughs> Theravada, Hinayana, Mahayana, Vajrayana, it's all the same Buddha we follow. So this happens. And of course it happens. And that's even in the suttas. However, there was a group of people that mostly not really Theravada, please excuse me, the people who practice Abhidharma and think the Abhidharma is more important than what the Buddha said in the suttas. You follow the suttas, the Antarabhava between realms exists. And that's what they usually, the spirits, if you like, the one of a better word, the person who's died does not get properly reborn yet. 
that's where they exist. It's just like a realm which you can actually say they existed between the real realm. So a person dies, and of course they stick around for a while. People see them as truth, and you can't reject that. And then after a while, then they get reborn again, or they go to some heaven realm or go somewhere. But that space in between is real. Okay. So Theravada doesn't reject that. Yeah. yeah. So one more um, request yeah, actually came up. Uh, my mother has introduced me to your teachings. I'm very grateful for it. She's very unwell now. Is it possible to send a letter to her, please? Thank you. Well, if later on, you can let me know her name. And then we maybe can now. Yeah, maybe because. now you could write in the name just for this yeah. person. You can yeah. write can in chat. the name. Yeah. Chat and then I can, of course, you can do that. It actually does work. Yeah. Please, and you also can know. send. Yeah. Yeah, we can all can. Yeah. I'll do that. What were you going to say, Aja? You were saying something. No, just we can all. We can we all can send all it. We can all do meta and it works. It's incredible, powerful. Yeah. So her name is Gossia, G-O-S-I-A. Right. Lives in India? Or what's she doing? No, I don't think so. Is she British? I think she's British. Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. The nationality Do you have the full she? name? Oh, it's a Polish name. Okay. Oh, uh, Polish. Okay. Yep, yep. What, 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 what town? What town? Yeah. Oh, G D A N S K. Oh, Gdansk. Yeah. Gdansk. Yeah. Do you know it? No, so there's a port where, uh, what was that? Uh, the union member who overthrew the communist government. Uh, oh, I don't know. Oh, it's, don't know. He was like, oh, he became a president later on. He was a pain in the butt for the communists. Okay. What was his name? Uh, like Walesa, Walesa, yeah, yeah, Walesa, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're having a bit of chat. Yeah, okay. that's when I was just a young man. Just thought it was really great until he actually really took power. It was not that good. It was great over, over <laughs> overcoming power. <laughs> when I was a very good leader. <laughs> anyway, so anyway, okay. uh, so Gossia from Gdansk. Gdansk, yeah, we'll do. Yeah, lovely. Okay, and I'm sure that we're all receiving lots of meta from these wonderful yeah. sessions, and uh, I certainly feel it, and I hope everyone else does too. So we can all send each other meta also anytime. Yeah. And hopefully, yeah. be in the field of love and kindness for the rest of this yeah. retreat. I hope it. I hope it wasn't too deep. And I, sometimes when I answer deep questions, it's I really feel it'd be wonderful if people were right in front of me because then we could actually continue the conversation. Anything you didn't understand, I could explain in more detail. But I do know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> unfortunately, that sometimes just one question, one answer is not really enough to really delve deep enough. So anyway, it's a start. And the thing is, I mean, it has to be practiced, right? Because just as sometimes mm. someone wants to hear something deep, but they get scared, equally, mm. you can hear deep stuff so much that <laughs> you think you know it and you're not scared by it, but you still haven't yeah. actually experienced it. So indeed, yeah. I think a little by little, the theory and the practice coming together is the best. Yeah. The theory is the map, the practice is the flashlight. Exactly. You can even find the truth. Yeah, very good. And anyway, we hope to get you over here in no long time. Yeah. <laughs> if not, if anybody knows any secret service, they can actually, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, not render me? Hmm? That means, that means I'll, I go to sleep here in Perth and then the secret service comes. And when I wake up in the morning, <laughs> I'm in a different country. I think it's better to just multiply yourself, Ajahn, because you said okay. the psychic power of just duplication or, duplication you know, tri or triple crikey. clay. How do you say? Make yeah, many, okay. make many. <laughs> make many, okay. But anyway, yeah. I might be messing around. So <laughs> may you all be happy and well, and I'll see you tomorrow. Excellent. Have a wonderful afternoon and evening. Yeah.
Yeah. Bye. Bye. Take care, Ajahn, and I'll see everyone in the evening. Hopefully, you've okay. all got the link for the meditation session, the quiet meditation session, and you've got lots of tools in your kit now. So you can either bliss out on loving kindness or you can lie down and die or whatever it is you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Good night, Arjun. Sleep well, if you wish. I will do, yes.